Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tyler Reed, and I'm the Manufacturing Applications Manager here at GoEngineer. Today's webinar is a continuation of our 3D Printing 101 and 201 series. Today's topic is the medical industry. This is being presented live in webinar format. That means you can hear me, but I can't hear you. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, Go ahead and type those into the questions box into the GoToMeeting tab or the chat box, and we'll review them at the end of the webinar. This is slated to be about 30 minutes. I don't have a good history of ending on time, but I'm going to do my best. Medical industry, turns out, is a big industry, and there's a lot happening in the medical industry with 3D printing, so there's a lot to cover. So what are the medical applications of 3D printing? Well, it turns out a lot of the applications that we see in the medical industry are the same applications that we see in the other driving industries, be it automotive, aerospace, industrial design, or consumer products. The primary applications that I came across in my research were prototypes, jigs and fixtures, tooling, teaching aids, and end-use parts. We'll be covering each one of these in a little bit more detail later on. But just a quick overview. Prototypes is going to be the basic application that most people think of. 3D printing has come a long way since it was known as rapid prototyping, but it's still used extensively in all industries, especially medical. Jigs and fixtures is an application that many people don't think about when they first purchase a machine or they start using a 3D printer. But we'll talk about some pretty exciting ways that people are using jigs and fixtures in the medical industry to help as, say, surgical guides and whatnot. Tooling is another application that's incredibly popular right now, but it's a secondary application in most people's minds. To give you an idea of how popular this was, when you signed up for this webinar, you were given the opportunity to ask questions. The most popular questions revolved around using 3D printed parts for tooling purposes, specifically for thermal forming and injection mold tooling. So I'm going to cover both of those in a little bit of detail during this webinar, especially the injection mold tooling because it's very applicable to medical applications because it's an industry that requires true to spec materials for certification and testing. Teaching aids is another application that's not quite as popular in other industries, but has huge implications in the medical industry. As we'll see, some of the examples that we look at allow physicians and doctors in training to practice on true real life models before they go on into the surgery room. And that level of training is invaluable because nobody gets things right the first time. I know I certainly don't. And so what we end up with is a situation where surgeons are actually learning in the operation room. That's how it's been for a long time. But we're reaching a point now with these 3D printed surgical aids and training tools that we can get a, a much better learning experience before you're ever in the chest cavity of a patient. And then lastly, end use parts. End use parts is becoming one of the most popular applications uh, for 3D printing in general. The 2014 Wohler's report listed end use parts as being 35% of parts uh, printed worldwide ended up as end use parts. End use parts means production parts. They means parts that are used in their printed form. We see an example of that in this photo here, which I just love. This is Emma Lavelle. And she's wearing a product called the Rex, which was developed by the Nemours Alfred I. DuPont Hospital for children in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, she was born with the inability to control her arms. Her muscles were too weak to control her arms. And so you can see she has this apparatus on here that kind of helps guide and direct and take off some of the strain her muscles would require to lift her arms. And so with this 3D printed apparatus, she's actually able to use her arms for the very first time. I read a lot about 3D printing and I do a lot of research and I tend to stay away from the feel good stories. But this one, this type of story and just in general, researching the medical applications of 3D printing has kind of opened my heart to a lot of the just really life changing applications that we see. Uh, and so I don't feel like I need to avoid these uh, these stories any longer because it's true. The people who are working in the medical fields, be it surgeons or medical device developers or people in the pharma side, they're helping people, and, and that was really uplifting do, doing my research for this webinar. So we talked about the primary applications of 3D printing in the medical industry, and I said that they're the same reasons we use it in any other industry. So what sets medical apart? What's uniquely medical? 
Something that's uniquely medical that when we're printing parts, we don't normally have to consider is sterility of parts. It's a requirement in many cases for parts to be sterile before they're used in or around a person. And there's a lot of different ways to sterilize a part. The types of sterilization methods that I have listed here are all, all methods that have been tested with Stratasys, FDM, and Polyjet parts and been tested to be successful 100% in sterilizing parts. Just real quick, flash autoclaving. Flash autoclaving is a process in my research. They said 132 degrees Celsius at, for four minutes, max pressure of about 0.12 megapascals, individually packaged in self seal sterilization pouches. 100% sterilization success on FDM materials, but the ABS based materials tend to deform under flash autoclaving. So this would be a polycarbonate only application. The rest of these types of sterilization, we saw no part deformity across any material. And real quick, after this slide, I am going to do a quick overview of the materials. I know this webinar attracted a lot of new people, and so you may not be familiar with the technologies that we at Go Engineer represent. And so I'm going to do a quick overview of the materials in the next slide here. Ethylene oxide gas or ETO sterilization. The studies I saw used amproline AN74I at 12 hour cycle, 100% success rate in sterilizing. Hydrogen peroxide gas plasma on a steroid machine, 55 minutes, max temperature 55C, traveling, uh, transporting parts in Tyvek pouches, which are, uh, can be permeated by hydrogen peroxide gas. Again, 100% sterilization is success. Gamma radiation is a type of sterilization that I've had some personal uh, experience with. Works totally fine with the FDM and the biocompatible MED610 materials on the polygest side. And antimicrobial coating is, was a new one for me in the research here, but Stratasys has some studies into investigating some commercially available water-based antimicrobial coatings. They were shown to uh, reduce bacterial growth by 99.9999% or 5 log 10 reduction. So that's a big one, sterilization. We have a lot of different options if you need sterile parts. Traceability is another uniquely medical situation. What I mean by this is material traceability, being able to match up with part batch and where the materials came from. This is a huge thing in the medical device industry, and we have material options that allow for full traceability. Scan to manufacture. I touched on this a little bit during the last webinar when we talked about impossible shapes or very difficult to create shapes. We talked about scanning used to create 3D models. This is used heavily in the medical industry. What you see here is a picture of a sea turtle flipper. It has a fracture in its flipper. This turtle is named Augie the Green Sea Turtle, and he was picked up or rescued by some doctors from the NC State College of Veterinary Medicine. They were able to do a CT scan of this turtle's flipper, detect where the fractures were, and then they developed a brace, again, 3D printed, so that the uh, Augie the sea turtle could rehabilitate in their care. And that brings us to the last thing here is organic shapes. The ability to create and manufacture shapes that are extremely irregular, organic, customized to a single person is no problem for 3D printing. All right, so a quick overview of the materials. Stratasys, who we represent at Go Engineer, has two technologies, FDM, which prints in thermoplastic materials, and Polyjet, which prints in thermoset photopolymers. The medical industry sees a mixture of both depending on what side or what area of the medical industry you're in. Medical devices tend to gravitate towards FDM, a lot of prosthetics tend to gravitate towards FDM, um, but a lot of prototyping where we're looking at fit and finish goes to the polyjet side. Just a real quick overview here. On the FDM side, we have ABS. That's kind of our go-to material. The industrial ABS materials are the M30 and the pharma grade material is the M30i. Another material here that's of some uh, interest is the ABS ESD7. ESD7 stands for electrostatic dissipative material, and it has electrostatic dissipative properties. Next is the ASA material, which is essentially ABS, but with additional UV blocking properties. Polycarbonate, 
Uh, we have a, a few different polycarbonate based materials of most interest, again, to medical industry is the PC ISO and the regular PC. So regular PC is a very cost effective, very strong material that can be used for prototyping. And then the PC ISO version is a traceability ISO certified version of the PC. So what we see in practice is people develop their products, their prototypes, and they do all their initial design work using the PC materials. And then when they finally go to get into a certification situation or an animal testing situation, they would switch over to the PC ISO material for the traceability. Nylon 12, very popular engineering grade plastic. Ultem, again, this is a popular material for high heat situations in biocompatible and food grade scenarios. And the PPSF material, which is a material that we don't see quite as often, but it is used in the medical industry. In particular, it's used for some MRI components, which we'll talk about in a bit. On the PolyJet side, these are all of our thermoset materials, our acrylic based materials. Uh, we just, we group them together by attributes essentially. So a rigid opaque material, we have a wide variety of those. These again are used mostly for prototyping and aesthetic models, but we will see uh, some injection mold tooling discussed in the transparent materials, which is essentially a transparent version of the rigid opaque. We do have a medical category specifically on the polyjet side. The most popular material is that first one called biocompatible or med 610. You'll see that referenced a lot if you do Google searches on biocompatible 3D printed materials. But we also have a full range of materials dedicated to the dental industry, which I'm not going to go into too much here, but it's a huge industry in and of itself. We have some simulated polypropylene materials, which can be useful, again, in a medical device situation. We have simulated rubber, which can simulate overmolding, soft touch feel that's pertinent to medical devices. And some digital materials. The digital ABS material we'll talk pretty heavily about when we talk about the injection mold tooling. Uh, but we also have the ability to print in full color and some variable flexible materials as well. Great for teaching aids. So that's a quick overview. Within those material sets, we have several groups that are ready to be certified. The biocompatible category is what we're concerned about today. These materials that you see listed here, the ABS M30i, PCISO, Med610, and Ultim 1010 are all ISO 10993 certified and USB class six compatible. The Med610, for example, meets standards for cytotoxicity, genotoxicity, delayed type hypersensitivity, and irritation. So it has four standards under the 10993. Cytotoxicity would be being toxic to cells, things like uh, venom, so it's not gonna poison you, poison your cells. Genotoxicity, those would be chemicals that damage or mutate your cells. You're not gonna have that situation as either. Delayed type hypersensitivity would be handling a material and then reacting two to three days later. No problem with those. And then irritation, you're not going to see any type of inflammation. As long as you stick within the prescribed time limits there, prolonged skin contact under 30 days, short-term mucosal contact. So any sort of interaction with the mucous membrane less than 24 hours, Med610 is rated for, which is pretty impressive for a 3D printed material. So most of the materials that we talk about are going to be within those groups today. So going back to the original applications, we're going to touch on each one of those here. The first category is prototypes, and I didn't dedicate a lot of examples to prototypes because I think it's a topic that has been discussed pretty extensively in the past. And so I'll, I didn't want to waste too much time on this, but I did want to bring up an example. This particular example is from a company called BioRep. They're a medical device OEM. They've been using 3D printed prototyping for the better part of a decade now. When I was researching this company, their engineering department said that their products had increased in complexity over time, which is something that we see across the board in all industries is part complexity increasing and therefore part design becoming more time consuming and part manufacturing becoming more time consuming and more expensive. So what they did is they started moving towards rapid prototyping 
I should say, 3D printing for their prototyping, and they brought it in-house. The reason they brought it in-house is that they claimed that they were able to print twice as many prototypes uh, within the same amount of time and for a less cost than going through a service bureau, and that helped them develop a better product. So what are you looking at here? This is something that they called a pinch manifold. And the pinch manifold is to help uh, medical labs evaluate fluids and helps them distribute the fluids where they need to be. This contains some what they call pinch valves. Conventional pinch valves, they're not known to be very reliable and they're quite expensive. And in the event of a power outage, they tend to unexpectedly open. So that's a problem. What they developed is this kind of novel, non-contact pinch valve. The device that you see here has 32 of these novel pinch valves. They were all developed internally. They were able to bring this part to market six months faster than expected using the 3D printing at a lower cost. Basically, to get down to the brass tacks is that their head of engineering said this wouldn't have been possible, would have not been for 3D printing. So we see this a lot in medical device fields. I personally used to work for a very large medical device company, and we use 3D printing for prototyping extensively. One of the scenarios that I like to reference is a situation where we were developing a product and we had some uncertainties about some of the uh, characteristics of the product. It was supposed to be a hand-activated device to inject some medication. That medication was, we were told later on, intended for arthritis patients. So we were, in, we were confronted with a, a very serious design problem where we had some, a product that was hand activated being targeted towards people who had very limited strength in their hands. And so we didn't quite know how to mold the button, shape the button, what the push force should be, the spring rate on that, the spring that we used. So what we did is we developed 74 different prototypes with varying characteristics. We put those in front of a group of arthritis patients. Basically, we rounded up every relative and friend we knew that had arthritis, and we had them try the devices. We were able to collect data from them, and we used that data to make a good decision on how we should proceed further on our product. We wouldn't have been able to do that if we couldn't come up with dozens and dozens of prototypes, and we couldn't have done those prototypes without 3D printing. Jigs and fixtures. So just starting in the top left, we have some examples from a company called Proteco. What they needed to do was achieve faster throughput in their dental implants. So what they did is they brought on an object Eden printer and they started printing these dental guides or surgical jigs really uh, to help them place the implants exactly. They went from a workflow that had a, a lot of manual work and relied on the skills of the dental surgeon to place these implants to a workflow that was fully digital. All right, they take an imprint of the mouth, they scan that into 3D. From that scan, they build a jig. In that jig, they insert these drill bushings, and then they can use that during the surgery to exactly place these implants. Basically, they're using these printers in pre-surgical planning and interoperative positioning verification. This company, Proteco, has been using the printer for all sorts of different applications beyond what I have showing here. What they've listed in their review of the printer, uh, customized oral and maxillofacial surgery, dental trauma, oral pathology, dental reconstruction, and correction of dental deformity and dental implants, so a wide range of uses. Kind of along the same lines, uh, moving to the right, is an example from a company called Medacta USA. What you see here is a patent pending uh, design called MySpine. It's a surgical aid, spinal surgical aid. It's been used successfully at the time of printing, which was in November 2014, just a couple months ago, uh, two times, both at the Spine Institute of Idaho. Essentially what it does is helps place the screws used during a spinal surgery. It's called a pedicle screw, and it's used to help support deformed spines. Everybody on this webinar, I'm sure, is quite aware of how sensitive an undertaking spinal surgery is. And so what this allows the surgeons to do is they go in pre-operation with a CT or an MRI scan. From those, they create 2D images, which have been used throughout time. Now there's a lot of different pieces of software, some of it open source, 
that can be used to very easily take those 2D CT scan images and construct a 3D model from there. That 3D model can then be pulled into a design software and these implants and surgical guides can be designed around the patient's, in this case, spine to have an exact fit. We also see a lot of the spine, in this case, the spine itself being printed and analyzed by the surgeons, again, pre-operation to help them come up with a plan of attack so that once they're inside the body, there's no surprises, they have a plan of action, and they actually have jigs that they can snap into place, orient and position these screws and insert them precisely. The next example that you see down in the bottom right is this exact same idea. This comes from a Professor Burton Ma, and it's used for a process called DRO. DRO is distal radius osteotomy. It's essentially deformation of the hip bone that is corrected using a plate. So you can see on the far right, the plate has been installed. The size and shape of the plate is customized to the patient and the location of the holes is customized to the patient. You can see two FDM drill guides there that snap into place on the bone. The same sort of process that I described for the my spine was done on this. They create a very exact 3D model of the part. They create some jigs that are gonna snap right into place and that's gonna allow them to come in with their drill and drill precisely into the bone so they, they can come out with a more accurate and less mistake prone result in the surgery. So the surgeries go faster, they're less risky, and they have better success rates. The other two images that you see in the bottom left-hand corner, these are non-surgical aids, but they're still jigs and fixtures that could be used in the medical device arena. I know personally, when I was developing semi-automated and fully automated assembly line equipment for medical devices, we had a lot of stations that looked exactly like what you would see on the left. And we machined a lot of parts out of aluminum and Delrin. All of those parts that we machined could have been very easily replaced by 3D printed parts. By replacing them with 3D printed parts, we could have consolidated parts, uh, meaning we'd have less parts to keep track of. The printing turns out to be cheaper and more cost effective in the long run and we'd have more design freedom, all of which is welcome for a designer in any industry. Another thing was transportation fixtures. Basically, taking a part and transporting it from station to station was half the equation. And so we always created these trays that perfectly conformed to the parts, and those trays, again, had some design difficulties and a lot of machining difficulties. So printing them would have been a no-brainer. All right, tooling. There was a question asked about thermoforming, so I decided to include that. Thermoforming is a process used to create a lot of packaging. Some of the examples that you see here are from Xerox. Xerox uses thermoforming for most of their packaging. Thermoforming is used to create very thin plastic parts. When I say plastic, it's used across a wide range of plastics, things like ABS, PC, HIP, PETG, Kydex. Our FDM parts can be printed with variable density. So you see in the upper left-hand corner, we kind of have a crosshatch internal to the part, and that allows us to very easily pull air or pull a vacuum through the part. Thermoforming starts out with a sheet of plastic. It's heated up, and then it's pulled over a form, and a vacuum is pulled that sucks the plastic and basically shrink wraps around the part. So you need to be able to pull a vacuum through the mold and you also need to have a mold that is going to withstand the pressure and the heat and our FDM products do that outstandingly. We see a lot of thermoforming tools printed out of basic ABS uh, but we also see some more robust tools printed out of the PPSF and Ultem. Probably the most impressive pool I've seen is about a six inch draw on a quarter inch Kydex which is kind of like a PVC mix. Very impressive on the thermoforming side. The next tooling category that I have is injection molding. This injection molding application has been a very hot topic lately, uh, probably the hottest application in 2014 in my experience. So what we're talking about here is printing the injection mold tooling so that we can use the tooling for short run, true to spec part creation. The images that you're looking at here are ones that I took at a company called Worrell in Minneapolis in late November. So these are very recent. 
Worrell is a design house that does primarily medical device design. They brought on this Toshiba 85 ton injection mold machine that you see here and a new the Connex 3500. And they're printing digital ABS mold inserts. We'll see a few pictures of them on the next slide here. The orange parts that you see here are created all from the same piece of tooling. They're polypropylene parts. They have a wide variety of features. They have some deep draw. They have a living hinge. They have variable draft and some variable wall thicknesses as well. In the upper left-hand corner, you can kind of see how the parts have changed a little bit. Starting in the bottom right was the first part pulled, and then in the bottom left is the latest part pulled. If you're familiar with injection mold tooling, you kind of know that there's some factors that come into play like mold temperature, the injection pressure, the injection temperature, and the duty cycle. So just to touch on some of those, the injection mold tooling that you see here was injected a mold temperature of less than 100 degrees F, which is uh, much cooler than you would normally expect. It injected polypropylene material. Polypropylene material, in this case, that was injected at about 490 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, a range from 2,500 to 4,500 PSI. Uh, Worrell expects these molds to last about 50 pulls. So when would you need 50 parts that are in true to spec material? Well, you need them for certification and you need them for testing. A lot of the parts that they create are sent off to animal testing and they're used for their customers to make design decisions and get certifications or testing done before they go into production tooling. The main benefit of using the injection mold tooling is that you can have parts, 50 parts within two to three days of sending your design. So they do all of the mold design, they create the mold, and they run 50 parts within three days. Compare that to your typical process, which is gonna be a soft tool made out of aluminum or a hard tool made out of steel, it takes typically six to 10 weeks, and it's gonna be at a cost of 10 to 30,000 is, is average. These guys cost out at 5,000 or under. All right, and they do a lot of the initial design uh, the mold design so that the production mold design is quicker. All right, so there's a lot of benefits to that. In this image here, you see some of their mold inserts of varying complexity. So they're all used in what's called a mud box, which is the image down in the bottom left. It's the aluminum outer housing. You only print the insert. Some of these inserts have, again, further inserts. So like in the top left hand corner, you see a part that has some slide action. Those slides are actually printed out of the Vero Blue material. This green material is the digital ABS material that's available on the Connex series. Uh, we also see some aluminum pieces and an aluminum pickout in the upper slide there. That pickout is called such because uh, the molded part is formed around that part and then it's picked out later on. They use aluminum or steel pickouts and inserts when design tolerances are higher than what they can achieve with the printed inserts. The printed inserts, they quoted me at a tolerance of a two to three thousandths inch per inch, which is fairly good. You see some of the same design criteria or design tricks that you would see in conventional tooling. We have removable gates up in the top right hand corner. We have some venting visible in the tool that's just to the left of that. The clear part that you see with the pickout still in there, that's a polycarbonate part. Polycarbonate material was the basically most impressive material that they had injected so far at a melt temperature of over 500 degrees. And they are able to successfully do that with these short run injection mold tools. So all very impressive. Impressive enough that we here in Salt Lake City decided to invest in an injection mold machine as well. Ours was not an 85-ton Toshiba. Ours was a $1,500 hand-operated Kickstarter, but it worked just as well. So imagine a drill press, but instead of a drill bit, you have a heater and a cavity that you fill with your plastic pellets, and it's just hand activated. So what you're looking at here was the first mold that I printed on the left-hand side, little just go engineer button 
These buttons are an inch and a quarter in diameter to give you some size perspective. I printed these on the 30 Pro in Vero Clear. So Vero Clear does not have the high heat capacity that the digital ABS, that green material, has, but this worked fairly well. You can see I took this picture after the molds had failed up in the top there. They failed after injecting some Delrin. So these parts that you see, the green is a polyethylene, the black is burn material, and the white is a Delrin material. The Delrin I was injecting at 470 degrees Fahrenheit which is about as high as our machine would go in temperature. And you can see the mold survived at that. And I created dozens of these buttons in different materials, ranging from uh, a TPE, a thermoplastic elastomer that injected at like 360 degrees, all the way up through the Delrin at 470. In between, I did polyethylene, polypropylene, and ABS all successfully. So I decided to step up the game and I wanted to do something a little bit more intense. So I wanted to do a pick out as well. Earlier this year, I created this uh, a knob using the FDM parts. Basically, we have a stainless steel hex bolt. When I created the previous version, I printed up to a certain point. I paused the print, I inserted the bolt, and then I printed over top of it. So I had a bolt internal to the part. Well, I wanted an injection mold version of this. So I designed again this little Vero Clear injection mold with a pick out, and I created the part that you see on the right. This part is black polypropylene. I injected this at 380 or 390 degrees Fahrenheit. So far, I've created about 10 of these, and the mold shows no signs of wear. And so what I wanted to show with these is just how approachable, like even a do-it-yourself setup is to the injection mold tooling. We still have a lot of inve investigation to do on this side, but I think this is gonna be a very hot application for many industries, but in particular, medical device industry, where there's a requirement to have true to spec material. I cannot print in polypropylene, but I can create a short run injection mold tool to inject in polypropylene. Just real quick, I wanted to show a video of this process. So this video runs about a minute and I sped up the, the middle part, but you can see our little setup. The mold I have bolted at the top to help prevent the mold from pushing out. One of the benefits of that clear material is that you can see it injecting and you can see that I kind of overfilled as well. As soon as I notice overfilling, normally I would keep pressure on the mold but for the sake of the video, I, I remove the mold immediately. And now comes the process of letting the part cool a little bit before I pull it out. You can see the plastic kind of running out. That means I'm injecting at a little bit higher temperature than I normally should. And the reason for that is because I could not, I didn't have a way to heat up the mold itself. And so I needed to heat up the plastic more than normal to give me a good flow. I'm gonna go ahead and pause that there. You can see I've pulled out the part, kind of displaying it there. I've got a little bit of flashing on the top, but that's a pretty good part that I made in less than a minute, and that mold is ready to go again. So I think that's very impressive. We're probably gonna do a little bit more extensive write-up on this in the future. But it was so pertinent to medical devices, I had to show it. All right, the next category, teaching aids. I'm gonna to try to blow through this as fast as I can because we've kind of talked about some of it. Along the left-hand side, we have some examples that are used in training medical students how to do pediatric operations. So you see a 3D printed rib cage. The rib cage is two size. What you can't see is that there's some cow tissue integrated into that model. So what this allows the students to do is they go into the classroom, they can practice their surgical moves on real tissue, and they can work in the confines of a real rib cage. This is the type of medical training that in my research is very cutting edge and allows students to learn outside of the operation table. All right, very important, especially on pediatric patients, which due to their size, it's very hard for a student to go into the operation room and watch a surgeon at work.
because they're working in such a tight confine. On the far right hand side, you see another model developed from a CT scan. This particular model is of a baby born in South America with something called Sturge Weber syndrome. It's a congenital neurological disorder that comes with a lot of bad consequences. Uh, things like prone to seizures, glaucoma, uh, skull malformations, tumors, and uh, what they call port wine stains on the face. The issue is malformed blood vessels on one side of the brain, which tend to calcify into the brain tissue, and then you lose lots of nerve cells located around the tumor. A lot of those complications can be reduced if the tumor is removed beforehand, as soon as possible. And so this particular model was used by Dr. Helio Rubens Machado at uh, the Medical School of the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. He used it to help come up with a preoperative plan, and he contributed to, in his words, a successful surgery. We're starting to see more and more of that. The same goes for the skull in the center there. That's a pre-operation planning tool. And the heart that's been segmented in the bottom center, that was created again from CT scan data. This was from a master's thesis by a student named Jason Kirk at Drexel University. He took CT scan data, was able to print a true to size, true to shape heart, segment it as needed, and they would actually present this to the surgeons and present it to the patient as well so that the patient can make more informed decisions about any sort of operation they were going to volunteer for. And then the image down on the bottom right, that came out of Oxford Brookes University. This was part of an event really geared towards children to teach them about microscopic organisms. But what they said is, as they were going through this process, even these kind of childlike models put in the hands of researchers help speed up research and help, to help the researchers kind of approach some of the questions that they had differently and come up with answers that they weren't able to come up with when they were only looking at 2D images. But putting a 3D image in their hands actually helped them approach the problems differently. So teaching age is a big one. And then the last category here, end use parts. I really think of in end use parts as being one of two things inside the medical industry. It's medical devices and it's prosthetics. The prosthetic side is one that's so heartwarming. I, I think it's one of the best uses of 3D printing, especially considering that a lot of the work that's being done is on a volunteer basis. A lot of the work is being funded by donations and charity. So what you see, those two images on the right, what those children are wearing are something called RoboHands. RoboHands is the name of the product developed by Richard Van Az out of South Africa. Basically, the story behind the RoboHands is Richard, he's a carpenter, he lost himself two fingers to a circular saw accident. He was searching on YouTube of some videos and he came across a man that had done puppetry. His name is Ivan Owen and he had been doing puppetry hands. So he approached Ivan Owen and together did, they developed what became known as the Robo Hand. They developed it using cables, screws, and 3D printed thermoplastics. What they've been doing now is they've been taking donations and printing out these Robo Hands for over 170 children around the world. And they're giving these kids a chance to use hands, use digits that they don't have. And that to me is just so touching. And it's really a situation where the technology existed to create these prosthetics beforehand, but it was cost prohibitive. The numbers that they quote are ten dollars to $15,000 for a set of comparable prosthetic hands where they can produce these hands for $500 a set. On the medical device side, I picked out some examples from MRI machines and some machines used in conjunction with MRIs. The reason why you start to see end-use parts, 3D printed end-use parts in MRI machines is uh, a few different reasons. Part complexity, okay, so what you see here are some coils. MRIs are produced in low volume, sometimes a volume as little as one unique part. They have very aggressive delivery schedules typically, and design changes occur on a regular basis. All of those are just the trademark reasons why you would choose 3D printing for an end use part. So what you see here are some polycarbonate PC or PC ISO parts used as printed 
in MRI machines. In the top left-hand corner, you see a linear axis guide. It's set on the table of an MRI machine, and it's used to help in prostate cancer identification. Some of the most important things, requirements for these MRI machines, especially these what they call 3T MRI machines, which are higher power MRI machines, are that they have very specific properties in what they call proton signal strength, magnetic field distortion, and RF dielectric strength. For Stratasys, we've tested the PC material, the PAC ISO material, and PPSF for all three of those attributes on the 3T MRI scanners. All of the materials printed passed in with flying colors. They were within allowable limits of the magnetic distortion. They were within allowable limits for the RF dielectric strength. Uh, basically, the test there is that they have to withstand 500 volts RMS charge without voltage breakdown. They all did that very well. And so basically it comes down to you have a lot of options, in, at least in the MRI scenario, where different materials are going to fit the bill. So with that, it's kind of the end of it. I really wish I had four or five different webinars to dedicate to this industry. Could have gone a lot more in depth, but I think this is a good introductory look at medical devices and medical industry and 3D printing. It at least is going to give you a structure to do further research on. Uh, my contact info there is in the bottom left-hand corner. So if you have any questions at any time, go ahead and give me a ring and uh, we'll talk about anything you want. Thank you guys again for joining. Thank you for sticking with me and uh, I'll see you next time.